Alrighty, I hereby <coughs> excuse me, call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Select Board. The time is 5.15 p.m. Our first order of business, as always, will be to approve minutes of the February 12th meeting. I'm also going to approve the minutes of February 12th. Second. All right, we have a motion made and seconded to approve the minutes of February 12th. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Three nothing, Jeff. Thank you. All right, our first order of new business will be the budget presentation by the South County EMS. Josh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. I have um, I've asked Tim Drumble to also join me. He is lurking in the background, but in case there are any questions I'm unable to answer, uh, Tim, feel free to jump in as needed, as always. Uh, so this budget <clears throat> for fiscal year 2025 uh, for the town of Sunderland uh, We've come up with uh, an assessment fee to Sunderland $281,536. Uh, this is a uh, increase from last year's $210,953. Uh, this is roughly a 31% budget increase uh, across all three of the towns that South County uh, supports and provides service to. Um, and this is kind of an expected thing, right? Uh, so one of the challenges that um, we have as an organization that I'm seeing moving in, uh, closing in on my first month in the position here, uh, is a real lack of supervisors, uh, supervisory staff uh, covering uh, the service 24-7. So that's a real oversight that uh, we can't really exist without. Um, th there's a lot of risk involved with not having supervisory staff, not just a uh, shared responsibility or somebody taking on a mantle of authority, uh, but actually somebody with a job description um, acting in a supervisory capacity. In order for us to maintain that 24-7, um, the personnel costs, um, have increased to reflect uh, some wage increases. In addition, there's a 2% COLA uh, increase that should go into effect this year. That's represented. On top of that, there is the as yet not filled deputy chief position, uh, which I hope to post uh, within the next several months. We're working on a hiring procedure for that. Additionally, there's my salary uh, included in there. And then under employee benefits, you see changes um, corresponding to those positions, accounting for that. As far as the operating expenses go, uh, we're at an interesting phase. Uh, South County EMS right now, I think for the last few years, uh, has been a bit stagnant in its uh, response capability. I think you know, the Board of Oversight and I have had some discussion about this, um, both on and off camera, um, individually and uh, as a board uh, meeting. Uh, we need to look to expand our operation a little bit uh, by providing greater support to our mutual aid partners in the region while not sacrificing our responsibility to the three towns that um, make up uh, a large part of our budget. So to that end, um, we do have a greater uh, than previous year's anticipated earnings. We've already uh, anecdotally seen some increase in call volume since we started this. So uh, if you look to page two real quickly, uh, we see that under revenue from service and retained earnings under medical service fees estimated, I've increased that line to $800,000. And I believe that to be a very conservative number. Um, it is more likely to exceed that, um, but I felt that that was safe. So that's one thing. And then I also wanted to make sure that we do put some of our retained earnings into next year's uh, budget. So uh, with that in mind, 
Um, where did I put it here? I think I put 80,000 uh, retained earnings. And this wasn't done last year, um, uh, which has kind of left us not in the best place. Um, so that does account for some of the uh, increase. On top of that, when we go back to page one and look at operating expenses, uh, anybody who's been to the grocery store in the last couple of years can just appreciate that everything we do costs more money now than it used to. I mean, that same, uh, that same problem extends to medical supplies, to vehicle maintenance, to the cost of fuel, to everything. So uh, as we go line by line very quickly, um, the operating expenses haven't increased too much. In fact, they remain uh, a pretty substantial decrease over previous years, excluding the last two years. Um, so uh, my hope is to get that down again as time goes by, but I think looking at the trend overall, um, we're in a good place. Medical supplies, uh, I have introduced some increase uh, up from thirty-three dollars to $40,000. This accounts for not only the increase in cost that medical supplies um, that we expend on medical supplies, but on top of that, uh, the this is anticipating the greater call volume. Well, yet again, uh, as we look to do more volume and improve the quality of our service, I do plan on introducing some new equipment to the department that uh, we currently don't have. These will also be conservatively rolled out, um, but all of this costs a little more money. So that's where we see perhaps the largest jump. In ALS medications, we actually expect the cost to go down, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, I think the $5,500 number is more in sync with uh, what we actually spend. Oxygen is level. Medical uh, equipment repairs and maintenance, uh, we do see a slight increase because we've added additional equipment uh, to the fleet. This, uh, these are additional uh, medical devices that were purchased over the last year that require maintenance uh, to facilitate their operation. Uh, and let's see, continuing down there, under fuel, we're simply doing more calls. Uh, the price of fuel fluctuates, um, but we expect to not only make greater use of our two primary ambulances, but also an additional vehicle. Uh, we have a support vehicle, which I expect to be running calls. Uh, I'll be meeting with Deerfield um, to talk about um, to talk about capital planning later this week to add another vehicle. Um, also coming out of retained earnings and the shifting of uh, some previous projects, the reallocation of funds. So um, nothing that impacts the fiscal year 25 budget, but we do expect uh, a greater use of fuel. Vehicle repairs and maintenance reflects that increased use as well, as does insurance. Liability is level. The rent fee, uh, I still haven't gotten a good answer why it's called rent, but I know what it's used for, and uh, that stays level. Um, still representing a decrease from fiscal year 2019. Uh, most of these things stay the same. I do have an increase in uniforms and laundry. There's the possibility that we may have to add personnel in the future. I'm not certain what that looks like today. Uh, it's just a possibility. But if we are going to promote some people to supervisory positions, they're going to need some uniforms. And currently, we have staff that are working in uniforms that I'd rather they not wear. Um, I'd like to maintain a more professional uh, appearance throughout our department, so we will need to replace some of these items. And uniforms are expensive. Um, other payroll costs is trending down. Billing, uh, the increase in billing that we see um, is just an increase. Uh, this is an anticipation of billing out more calls, is all that is. As we continue down, um, 
Under professional ed and training, I've decreased it by $12,000. Uh, I do have plans to dramatically um, alter uh, the way in which we do professional education and continuing education training uh, for the department. That much of it can be done at a substantially reduced cost, but it is important to not totally fall flat on that number as we look to uh, purchase some durable equipment that will remain with us for years to come, making that possible. Good question for you. I see that up on the top under personnel costs, you have a new line item called training for just shy of 17. Um, yeah, is that sure. like a shifting yeah. of money from the one line item to the other line item? What's the, what's the deal with that? Yeah, sure. My apologies for skipping over that. Um, there's actually a couple items I might have inadvertently skipped over. So um, you are looking at training a new line item 16938. Uh, the idea with this is paramedics are required to do a minimum of 60 hours of continuing education every two years as part of their recertification cycle. If we divide that over the two years and say 30 hours of education per year, what this allows our staff to do is get paid for uh, mandated training. This is training not only mandated by our department, but it's mandated by uh, the Commonwealth and the National Registry uh, if we're to maintain credentials. So uh, the past practice has been people are on their own with that. And uh, I know that, uh, Tim, feel free to jump in. I think this was something that uh, the department at large was hoping to be compensated for because it does represent time away from home. Oftentimes it can represent missing part of a shift um, and we have to backfill that shift with somebody now uh, because the, the dates of training don't always coincide with days off. And the way that these trainings work is I can't simply expect to do everything while on duty. Uh, the reason being, if I miss so much as a minute of that training to step out and do an ambulance call, I can't sign the roster, I can't receive credit, uh, and I just wasted everybody's time. Uh, so this is a real effort to uh, compensate for that too. And just to, just to expand on what uh, Chief was saying, um, the, the thought when we originally proposed this was that right now, if, if I have a training, let's say on Thursday when my next shift is, my options are to use my own personal time to get paid to go to that training. And it's kind of like all other municipal public safety departments, you would just get detailed off your shift and get paid to go to that training. But now the only way I can attend that additional training or even that required training is to use my own personal time, which is not the, the best way to use your vacation or your personal days. Um, if, if we're requiring people to do this training, the thought behind this, this change was that they're required to do it. We shouldn't be making them use their own time off to be compensated. Um, that was why we started talking about this. Now, that, that seems to me like a contract negotiation question, not so much a budget presentation question. Was that part of sure. the uh, oversight uh, committee? Currently, uh, uh, the EMTs and paramedics of South County um, do not fall under a collective bargaining agreement. They don't, okay. Yeah. So prior to this proposal, they've been handling their training on their own, either on their days off, taking vacation time, et cetera, in order to do the training. Um, this puts them being paid, and this is also figured at time and a half, correct? It is. Another way to look at this um, is the, uh, the $15,000 um, reduction in professional ed and training, or I'm sorry, the 12000 12. This can mostly be reallocated to this with uh, some addition. Okay. I mean, I, I don't necessarily disagree with the intention of it. Um, I just question whether or not that's something that, that should be have more of a conversation between the towns and whatnot, as it's more of a personnel yeah, a compensation I, issue than it is a operating budget issue. It's it's a, akin to the the department deciding to give a raise to the workers outside of 
the town's having a say in that. So, I'm not saying necessarily sure, it's a bad I'm idea. Just agreed completely. But if I don't budget for that, then where does it come from? That's fair. Yeah, I mean. Can I ask a question? Please, please. What's the policy with the police and fire department as far as training compensation? Can, can we speak to that? Well, it's, I can talk about in Sunderland. Um, in Sunderland, the police officers, if if it's not required in person, like um, the vehicle chasing stuff, yeah, so it's driving, all that. Yeah, stuff. it's online. Um, they they try to do it when they're on duty and not on a call. But I assume that that's because it's asynchronous and maybe. Um, that's not the way EMT, you know, you can't pause the train and go out on a call, come back, unpause it, sounds right. like. so. I mean, there's obviously some you can, some you can't. It's, yep. um, it just... So basically, if you were looking at compensating training at straight time versus time and a half, that number would get basically cut by a third. Yeah, so 17 would go down to 12, 10 and a half, 12. 12. Yeah, no, I, I'm just, you know, looking at potentials. Let me do some real quickly here. So if I do, uh, the problem with that becomes it's not that I'm looking to pay people over time to go do training. Um, what I'm looking to do is make sure that when people are training, I can cover the adults. So, uh, you know, Tim's not necessarily asking to get paid over time to go take a class. That would be really nice, no doubt. But uh, really the bigger issue is if he needs to uh, depart his shift while still remaining straight time, and I need to backfill that shift, I may have to pay a few hours of overtime to somebody else. I might be able to find a pretty young employee to come cover that shift. Um, I might, they might be able to do it with no transaction uh, financially, right? Or maybe it's a swap. I mean, there's lots of methods here. Uh, but the reality is if I don't budget it for overtime, the other thing is our overtime itself uh, is profoundly, um, I view, underfunded. Uh, I know that finance committees uh, look at overtime often as a dirty word, but the reality of this is we run a 24 seven operation uh, as an uh, emergency service. If I can't get somebody to fill that shift, it's simply unacceptable. So, uh, you know, operating a department our size on a $40,000 overtime budget, which is a substantial decrease from previous years um, is already a stretch. So. Were you given the history of, of why it's it's gone down? Because there was a case made three years ago for hiring an additional employee, and the case was if we hire this employee, overtime will go down. So that that's that's how the I assume the previous director was budgeting. So yeah, that makes sense to me for sure. Um, and I'd say overall that probably has happened. Uh, that prediction was probably accurate. However, once again, we are looking to increase our call volume to uh, make up for revenue um, and try and prevent the assessments from increasing in the point, right? So if I could kind of back up to uh, one of the, and just reiterate something, the idea that um, we can just keep doing what we've been doing without embracing any change or growth and expect that it's going to go down in costs uh, is unrealistic. The idea that it will remain level funded is also unrealistic. If we change nothing about our department, if we make no investments into its future insofar as its staffing, its vehicles, its capabilities, its communications, and all of the myriad components that go into it, 
what we're looking at is a future where every single year ahead of us, we're going to be increasing the assessment. What I'm looking to avoid is a future years down the road where this conversation turns from how can we reduce this line item's fee to one of is this something we really need to be in the business of doing at all? And I think we can get there. I think we can definitely get there. And we can work to reduce assessments over the next several years. But we're not going to do it by not training, by not paying our people, by not covering our shifts, and not having the equipment that we need to do the job. The only way that we're going to narrow that margin and make up for uh, that difference is simply by doing more ambulance calls. That means making ourselves available to mutual aid partners throughout the region more frequently. And if we're going to maintain our core service of providing care to the residents of Deerfield, Sunderland, and Waitley, we're going to need to accommodate so this budget is what I view as a fairly shoestring attempt to achieve that. So on the full-time wage line, there's obviously, you know, line 15, it's obviously an increase. I know you've talked about, um, you know, the deputy chief, the, I don't know, I think you called them captains or the supervisory staff. What's kind of the breakdown of that? Because it's kind of hidden there, right? We're looking at, you know, about 700,000 and we're going, we've got an increase of, you know, just over 85,000, but it, it's, it's kind of hidden wh what that is because it's obviously much more than a 2% COLA. Sure. Well, it's not so nefarious as to be hidden, uh, but I understand. Um, what I did was I took our most expensive employees um, and multiplied them times four after the July 1st 2% COLA raise, and I gave them an additional COLA raise on top of that um, for entering into a new job description as a captain. Uh, so that may not actually be the case, uh, but I'm budgeting for a worst case scenario. Okay, so that additional, how much is that additional for those four employees? Um, excluding the, um, let me just do them out real quick. So that would be, bear with me here. So we're looking at one million forty-three thousand nine hundred forty-eight dollars. So roughly ninety thousand dollars difference. So I'm at. So there, you said that there was an additional cola for four people. What is that additional cola? Is it another two percent? Is it another nine percent? Is it? Uh, 30%? Yeah, I, I didn't understand the question. Uh, so that represents a 5% increase. So, so that's 5% for interest. captains, for the people who are going to become supervisors. Supervisors. So then leads to another question, the deputy or the assistant, or is that going to be a salaried position or is that an hourly wage position? So that's in the works, ideally, this would be FLSA exempt salary position. A what salary? I didn't hear the Exempt salary. One, yeah. Meaning that they don't get overtime if they go over 40. Yeah. So, what would that person be working opposite shifts of you and be able to cover some of the, you know, and maybe, you know, as a step one? 
drop down the number of captains or the number of supervisors that you need by working an opposite shift of you and being available? Is that? No. No? So, no. So the way that uh, I kind of have this planned out is, and we did speak to this at the, uh, the Board of Oversight meeting. Yeah. Uh, you know, but everybody in town didn't hear that, so we kind of well, need no, to talk no, about it no, here. I understand. So, uh, essentially, if if you take your administrative support, put them on the road, you don't have the administrative support you need, nor do you have the road employee that you need. It's as simple as that. So, as we look to uh, expand our call volume and hence our revenue we're going to require greater administrative support the way that i envision the deputy chief position is one who can manage the day-to-day -day operations of the department this is going to include items such as scheduling the filling of open shifts uh, this is going to be oversight of vehicle maintenance, um, all of the little things that, um, you know, oftentimes an administrative professional would perform, um, in a, but somebody who has inherent knowledge of an EMS system. Additionally to that, uh, what I'd like to do is staff them during the daytime, mostly in parallel to me because that does give us the opportunity all of a sudden on an as needed basis we have an additional two paramedic team which can respond to either large incidents uh, as part of the incident command system framework in unified command or uh, we can do intercept work in the event that everybody else is already out which is a pretty reasonable scenario so as much as I make the argument that I don't want the administrative staff to be uh, tied up with scheduled ambulance shifts, there's a very real possibility that the admin staff will be doing emergency work, but in a different capacity. So I think the best way to achieve that uh, is somebody who kind of exists uh, along the same framework uh, during the week uh, with me. What that leaves me with is weekends and overnights, I have no supervisors. Uh, and during the daytime, if the deputy and I are at a finance meeting, or if we're at a select board meeting, or if we're meeting with um, a mutual aid department um, to go over whatever. And you know, realistically, uh, so far, this has happened, I'd say three out of my five days a week, uh, I'm busy doing something like that. So if we're off doing that, I don't have a supervisor present at the station who can handle incidents. Uh, so that's kind of the idea behind Thor. Thor uh, would allow 24 seven coverage. Uh, we essentially have four groups of people that work with our schedule. I have looked at different schedule models. That's kind of an ongoing thing I'm considering um don't have any plans on doing right now but and how many full-time anyway, employees do you have total or currently um how many? but any way that we so FTEs total schedule is still going to necessitate multiple groups of people no i mean how many full-time employees total yourself excluded without myself currently we have 10. so we're talking 10 people a director assistant director four captains and four non-captains? Is that what we're yeah, talking here? Uh, and so, yeah, I get where you're going with this. It sounds pretty top heavy, right? It, yeah. it sounds top about top heavy by it about four people. <laughs> it sounds it, you're talking about having six six managers for four non-managerial people. Like, that, that's, a, that's a supervisor that for one sure. person. <laughs> I can see where you would see that, but uh, that's not how it is actually. What we're looking at is two manager positions um, and we're looking at four supervisors who are not managers who don't have administrative capacity who aren't uh, 
FLSA exempt who are basically a conduit um, who have some supervisory role, uh, but they're definitely not managers. Uh, it seems top heavy until you look at the way that we staff. If I have two ambulances on the road, one of those people is going to be a supervisor. That's not top heavy at all. So you only have one, one EMT per ambulance? No, there's two. So ambulance. that's four people. You don't need two. That's what we're saying. You don't need two supervisors for four people. If you have two ambulances on the road, one of those people is a supervisor supervising the other person with them and the other two people in the other ambulance. That's not top heavy. Having two supervisors for four total people on the road, that's top heavy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If we have two ambulances on the road, that means out of those four people, one of them would be a supervisor. That the math doesn't work though, because you're talking about having four people total who aren't supervisors, four supervisors. That means a one to one ratio between supervisors and non supervisors, not a one to three ratio. I'm so confused where you're getting the. He's adding in per diems and part times. So you asked for full time employees. So, right? okay, so, so, you're, so, okay, so, so you're saying that of those, of those four people out in those two crews, one full time supervisor, one full time employee, and two part time or per diems? Is that. Maybe. So it, there's some variability of it throughout the week. Uh, it's not quite that easy. So, you know, the way that we do our schedule um, would make a sane person mad, um, which is one of those, one of the reasons I'm looking at um, alternatives to it. However, if I have two ambulances running concurrently and I have four people on, there could be a lot of variability. I could have the mixing of groups. I could have the mixing of paramedics and EMTs. I could have all paramedics. I could have all full-time one day. I could have mostly per diem another day. There's a lot of variability. So the idea here is if I promote four people to a supervisory position, each group has a supervisor and we build the schedule around that group so that we're never staffing multiple supervisors at once. Um, I'm not looking to, you know, have a bunch of supervisors running around. That's ridiculous. The idea is that there's somebody there. Which brings us back to the, do we need to have the director and the, and the assistant director be on the same time? And I understand you say that you want to be able to go to these meetings, both of you, but do we need to have two people in a finance committee meeting? Do we need to be paying our two highest people out of a uh, crew of 11, including yourself, um, at the expense of then having to have supervisors the rest of the day, the rest of the night? Um, I understand that you're saying that there's a need to increase things, there's a need to do a whole bunch of things, but you're giving us a budget that's 33% higher than it was last year we have a two and a half percent increase to our town's finances as well as other towns in the district and what you're asking is to do a whole lot of things all at once you're asking to do a, a large increase in the salary you're asking to do a training increase you're asking to do uh, i mean uh, the medical insurance is going up by 50 percent there's there's you know if you staggered this over the next four years it would be a little bit more you know acceptable to handle from our perspective but we're talking about a giant increase, and I understand that you're saying that you're trying to, to grow in order to increase revenue, re revenue. but if you are growing to increase revenue, that shouldn't mean an increase in the, the assessment to the towns. If, if we're paying to subsidize that growth, then that's not good growth for the, for the EMS or for the towns. So I'm confused why we're seeing 33% if you're saying that the revenue is going to be substantially higher. Because... Yeah, please, Tim. If it's okay, if I. So, part of the major reason for the increase is uh, excluding the things that Josh is increasing in the budget, is we're not dumping the retained earnings in that we normally do. If you look at the retained earnings line item, there's only that 80000 compared to the previous years that we've been dumping in um, $292,000 or $172,000 or $310,000. Um, and that primary reason the assessment is up as much as it is because. Last year, we had to make those critical purchases for cardiac monitors where we took all of our retained earnings and dumped it into the budget, um, which was the conversation with the Board of Oversight and the previous director at the time. 
that unfortunately has hurt us from a budgeting standpoint for this year. And part of the conversations that we had before Chief Sparks took over and stuff was that we knew this was going to happen, but even if we didn't, like there would still be an inc a pretty significant increase even without that increase in the personnel line item. Um, it's just we had to, like, we didn't have a choice to not replace replace those cardiac monitors to the tune of approximately $150,000. Um, which is why that we just don't have the retained earnings to supplement our budget. And I know there's been conversations over the years about if using retained earnings to supplement the budget is the best way to manage it. And I don't know the answer to that, but just to add some more context as to why it's, the assessment is up as much as it is. It's not just tied to those personnel costs, if that makes sense. No, that's like incredibly helpful. And next time lead with that. <laughs> um, because no, that, I, I was unaware that was where that huge chunk of that increase was coming from. Um, so I was just trying to figure out where we got up to 33%. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't disagree that um, operating from a retained earnings standpoint is necessarily a, a great way of doing things. Um, but that actually, that explains a lot more. But you know, we're still left with 16.5% increase in personnel costs. Yeah. 16.5%. We're talking about whether we can afford two and a half or 3%. In most of our people in town, I mean, it's very, very important to have people compensated well. It's very, very important to pay for all these services, but it's it's 16.5 percent when we're asking everyone else to take three percent. It doesn't. It's hard for us to sell this to the town. Like people are going to freak out at yeah. the town. Meeting. Well, and, and and we're already in a position town-wide where we're going to have to make some hard decisions this year. And it, knowing that we're, we're this much more money is going into the EMS when we're going to have to ask like. You know, for cuts across the board or that kind of stuff, or be looking at a huge override, um, is going to be a real hard pill for the town to swallow. Um, one more question, and then we do have to start getting wrapped up on this, um, and that is the uh, medical insurance line item went up by like 50%. What's the deal with that? That was budgeted assuming that the new hire, the deputy chief, would take the most expensive plans available. Um, if I could, I'm sorry, Chief, just to, um, when, and I don't know if you've had a separate conversation. When I originally had this conversation, it was built on, we had additional employees who weren't taking insurance last year who are now taking insurance, and then there was yourself as well um, taking the insurance. Um, but the when the town accountant or town collector gave me that information, it was that it was anticipating the employees taking the higher end of the insurance and I might be mis misremembering, but some of the employees did take the hiring of the insurance, which is why there's such a significant increase. We just, we, we didn't know until, obviously, they ran the numbers, who was taking insurance. And I think we may actually be overspending the line item last year because they under budgeted, but I can't, I don't have those figures right in front of me, so I'm not entirely sure about that. It just seems like a huge increase from 2022 at 52,000 up to 133,000 in three years. Um, and I understand if you're saying that it's, it's largely driven by employees taking insurance than before, we can't obviously control for that. Um, that's just, again, that's another huge increase. And that's what I'm saying is that any one of these increases would be hard pill to swallow in a year. Tagging six, seven increases like this all together into a 33% increased budget is straight up not attainable for our town. Um, we're gonna have to have conversations about this. Well, um, I am open to discussion about this for sure. I would also like to see this go down. I also think that if we sacrifice on a lot of these things, that conversation that I fear happening is going to happen. Well, that conversation is happening. It's happening right now. Um, is we, we, you're saying I want to avoid future increases by doing the increases now, and we're saying, yeah, no, no, that doesn't work for us. Um, I, I get that you're, you're concerned, but what you're talking about here is not mm -hmm. level services. What you're talking about here is a substantial increase in services, which is not something that a town like ours can handle on a normal year, let alone a year where every department is coming to us with a 7 8% increase in things. Um, and so, you know, I get your concerns. I get what you want to do with the department. Unfortunately, the money is not there. And so what we need to have a conversation about is where is the... What, what is the level services conversation? Where is that budget that, that we need to look at? So we can start talking about where, where the middle between those two is. I think if you're looking to increase my budget by 2%, we're not gonna make payroll and we won't exist by the end of the year. Which I understand, but there's a world of difference between 2% two, 2%, 2.5% and 33%. 
like, you know, we're not saying no, you can't have any more than the two and a half percent that we can budget. We're saying 33 percent is astronomical. So, I mean, you've only also been here a month, right? So you're kind of trying to get a sense of all these different towns and all these different politics, right? But when Sutherland joined yes. South County, Right, this, they were sold this whole, like, we're going to save money, and it turned out we didn't actually save that much money. But there's this whole history in the town. I can just hear the comments from the floor. Like, it's not even me who believes that. I actually think we got better services and we made a fine deal. But there's going to be people like, what the heck? Right? The, you know, why did we agree to the South County thing in the first place? Because people have a long memory. <laughs> and that goes back to what Jeff was saying about the overtime is that we, we explicitly agreed, what, two or three years ago, right. okay, we'll pay for an extra full-time employee to cut back the overtime. And if you're coming in this year and saying that we're going to go back up to a, a total of, what, 93000 which is higher than it's even ever been in any of the past years on overtime, while also increasing your full-time employees and also adding supervisor positions and also and also and also, that's a problem. Um, I well, did have a couple other little you, questions. Like you, you increased the fuel. Fuel went up fifty percent. Software fees went up by seventy nine percent. I don't think you. I heard why that was going to go up. I mean, I know fuel's all over the place, but we've had it's all been all over the place for thirty years. I don't see that's going to change. Do you know if something about real quick. oil sorry, futures sorry. or something? If, if I could clarify real quick, just before, just because you mentioned the overtime. The, the overtime in the, the way that it's budgeted is misleading. It looks like it's going up to 93000 which is way more than last year. The, the holiday pay is a, the holiday pay and the overtime line is increased by the current line. Um, so that 53000 is roughly 49000 where it's dashed out in 2024. For some reason, the way that the previous budgets were done in the past years, that information was blacked out. And I don't know why it was blacked out. Um, when I started doing the budget, I covered it. But it's not, so the overtime is increasing, excluding the training line item, which I know can be discussed further down along the road. The overtime is only increasing by COLA. The overtime, we didn't add anything else supplemental to that. It's just that 53,000 represents the holiday pay that were mandated by town of the bylaw to pay. Um, and so, then the 40,000 is just the increase in shift overtime with COLA. So where was that 53,000 last year then? No, what? he's saying this should have shown 49,000. Last year. For last year. Okay, well, going up to well, what I'm saying is that, like, sure, but then when you add all these numbers together, that doesn't include 49,000. Where did that money come from to pay that last year? If it's not in the last year budget, if it was blacked out, if it was not included in the dollar. It was in the budget, it's just poor. I, I, so the I, I, don't, I don't know why Zoe <laughs> built it this way, but it was budgeted correctly. It just doesn't show up in this budget for some reason, and I haven't understood why it's not when I started building the budget, was not able to find that out. I, I understand the concerns you're, raise, you're, you're raising. Um, I just wanted to point out that that isn't, the overtime isn't increasing by as much as it looks like it might be increasing. So I think we have to run, we have another budget presentation in two minutes, um, but obviously we'll be in touch and we'll um, talk about how we can get a closer um, to, to what the select board was talking about while um, maintaining as much well, of... Well, and again, maybe after talking with Deerfield and Waitley and, you know... Are we the first time that you've talked to? Yes. That's right. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for your time. I, I appreciate everybody. Your fourth time. month, you won't have so many meetings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You also got your, your heaviest meeting month. Uh, is, you know, you're coming into that, so. I promise we're also usually a lot nicer. Um, Jeff, do we need to do anything special to call us into the other meeting or just join and... Uh, no, we're just going to let everybody know that um, we are now joining the uh, Frontier Regional School Committee that uh, if you want to join as well, the link is posted on the agenda for the select board. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. I, I, sorry, I had to be a little bit harsh there, but I had some questions that needed answering. You know, I was sitting here writing all these numbers down. <laughs> what? <laughs> all right. So, by the way, the, re the retained earnings, I mean, look at the bottom line between last year and this year. It went up 3000 didn't go down. <laughs> yeah.
No, I appreciate the the, the I nod from you on that one. Yeah. I don't think this that's gonna go well with their filming way either. Oh, okay. if, if, if it does, much, I have questions for them. Do you see how much Deerfield's increases? Down at the bottom it says each town's assessment. Yeah, yeah they're going up by a hundred and fifteen thousand or something like that. Well, it's better than the, the first one he came out with. We uh, were, we're still probably on TV. Okay. Just, sorry. No, no, no. I just wanted to point out. That's fair. We're still on TV. Hi there at home. How's it going? <laughs> 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 All right. Are we, uh, we're doing it. Okay. So I'm assuming the rest of the stuff on our agenda will just push off till next meeting, or do we want to try to re recoalesce -re 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 after the... No, I don't think, yeah, I think. Okay, nothing seemed like it was on fire on the rest of the stuff. Oh, we are muted, so if anybody wants to um, speak, just let me know. Wait, more volume? One next to the. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah. There it is. Well, Chris Larrabee got himself a very nice picture there. Yeah. <laughs> he looks like he's twelve. <laughs> he just looks so young today. Are feeling 
um, the effects of inflation following COVID, uh, cost of supplies and materials is significantly higher than it has been in previous years. So while we talk about level service as the starting point, there is always a natural increase. Um, we work hard to balance that natural increase while also looking at our new needs. So we're going to move on and start with uh, level services. And what those numbers look like. So what is the level of service increase uh, for fiscal year 25? So we are looking at level service came in at 2.62 percent or roughly 330,000. You can see the composition of the increase there is split between wages and non-wages. Uh, contractual increases for union employees represented a 2 percent COLA plus a step which varies depending on the teacher or the IA contract, but it's an average of about 4% per step increase. That number can be higher if you have someone who advanced their education and has a higher degree and they're seeing column movement within the contract. So some employees will actually receive, instead of the two plus four, it might be two plus five or six, depending on how far advanced um, they went with their degree. So, that's important to take into consideration here because it's not level across the board for all staff, and it does have a big impact. Um, Non-union employee wages include any other staff in the building, uh, secretaries, cafeteria, custodial, administrative staff that are on individual contracts. If I left anyone out, I do apologize. It's <laughs> just an oversight on my part. Um, and then we also look to capture savings due to retirements or attrition. So if we know we have someone retiring and they were a veteran teacher, they've been here for 20, 25 years, uh, we expect to hire at a lower step within the contract, so we take that into consideration as well. Uh, I believe for Frontier that is about $70,000 savings this year, or this level of services would be that much higher, closer to 40000 Non-wage increases impacting the budget uh, year to year are always our non-employee insurance or liability insurance, particularly our student accident insurance. Uh, some of those are based on claims, some of it's just based on the market. Um, health insurance is a significant factor. The district has not seen a significant increase in health insurance rate in some years. In fact, um, prior to last year, for five years, there was no increase with the Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust. Last year, there was a 6% increase. This year, we're seeing an 8% increase. So that has been reflected in the budget as well. Retirement contributions, uh, those are twofold. Uh, what we contribute to Franklin Regional Retirement for anyone who is not on the teacher contract, we are assessed annually. That contribution has gone up this year, as well as our um, employee separation costs we take into consideration there. So based on the teacher contract, there is a sick buyback when teachers retire. This year, that worked out in front year's benefit. Um, we have a savings in that line item. So that's reflected in the budget as well. Transportation and building grounds and maintenance are also significant drivers in our non-wage increase. Uh, transportation, I know that the, the bid and the contract uh, info was sent out to school committee. I think that trickled out to town administrators as well. It is an agenda item later on on the agenda, I believe, for executive discussion, our session for further discussion on that. But what I will say in this regard is Frontier is not seeing the same level of impact to the budget as the elementary schools. Because the way that the prior contract was structured and some changes that we had within the contract in the last five years, for example, um, the, the budget is built for 12 buses. The last two years, we've only been using 11 buses based on membership. So there already was a buffer built in, and then we added a 10% increase. So from here is not bearing the brunt of the significant transportation cost increase um, next year, although there is 40,000 additional built in. Um, building grounds and maintenance, we have not increased these line items in at least the five years that I have been with the district, and we spend it over repeatedly. Uh, budget subcommittee and administration and eventually the school committee felt like it was time to add in some additional funds. Our regular, uh, our typical budget for buildings and ground maintenance is about 70 to 75,000. We're increasing that to 100,000 in the new year. And again, that's primarily related to supplies and materials and cost of contract with services. Any types of repairs that we're doing are significantly higher than they were um, the 
particularly in the last few years since COVID. All right. You want to take questions? Sure. Do you have any questions? Uh, Linda, you have your hand up? Linda, do you have a question? Uh, well, I'm going to fill it internally, or is this something that's 
going to be advertised and you will be going out for an AD that has experience to bring that inside. Well, so it'll get posted and if someone internally wants to apply, they're certainly welcome to. Um, I think the tricky part with this that we're going to have to navigate is in order to teach PD, you have to have teacher qualifications sure. as well. So, you know, George will be seeking unique candidates that can fulfill both those roles. But the idea behind this position, and again, please interrupt me, George, if I'm not translating properly. The idea behind this is that they will teach an afternoon class so that they can have flexibility in the schedule to flex and be here more at night when they need to, so that they're not burning out whoever this person is in the role. Because it, it, the athletic director position is significant. I think MIA said that they have to show up all game. You can give them a game of your school. You can give me an assigned person in a tournament game to have an actual school. So, going back to the numbers, when you look at the line by line budget, you are 100% correct. It does show that we are jumping from 11 to 75 because of all of those changes that have taken place in the last few years. Okay. And yeah. you look at that both by the budget. I mean, personally, I mean, that, uh, but who will manage that person and have to, as if it's, I mean, it almost falls to the bit of the um, Medicare and nursing route of um, some specs. And um, the athletic trainer has a bit of a go outside and um, contract. So we are looking at a contracted service with um, Cooley Dickinson and Scotch Mouse for the Williams. They have these services available. They did provide us a full team of staff. Um, it would be a full-time position. The uh, trainer would be at all wrestling and all football events as required. Um, and then that's required by MIA. And then on-site available to assess injuries, whether it's you know, during a game or post injury, you know, that kind of thing with the students maintain inventory, um, you know, kind of work with coaches, who they would report to. There is some structure in the contract about who they report to at the hospital that can follow up there, but then here it would be, you know, ultimately between George, the AD, Scott Dredge, and any of those who So we understand the need for this, it's just a matter of time to it. We contract out primarily with local EFT or other athletic trainers, but it's only at the required events for only at football and only at wrestling. Yes. Okay. But not necessarily the same person. Right, no, it's definitely, you're going to use the MTA to All right, we have questions from the Sutherland Select Board. Yeah, that's just me. Um, could you ask whoever's speaking in the room to please speak up or come up to the microphone because we're having a lot of trouble hearing some of the people. Thank you. Okay. Oh, the microphone's not for me. Yeah, that should be that should make every stuff. No, they can hear. The ear is fine right now when I'm talking, right, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, I get, I heard you and Shelley. It was I think people not not at the front. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome to some greenhouse and everything. Okay. budget. There are grants of almost 400000 
and roughly 1.4 million in revolving funds that we use as well. So moving forward, when we talk about funding sources, we are talking about a total budget of $14,772,071. <laughs> All right, what's next? We're going to talk about expenses next. I'm not going to read through this. Um, this was in the major uh, narrative handout, but this is the part of the account narrative that Desi sends us as what we categorize expenses are. Um, there are really five or six primary categories. District administration, instruction, pupil services, plant operations, benefits and fixed charges, and then programs related to other school districts. So that's our out of district placement costs. And Howard Frontiers expenses distributed. So just a few quick facts in here 47% uh, of the budget are directly related to instruction slash teaching and learning. So that is anyone. Uh, that's working directly with students, so teachers, um, IAs, administrative staff in the main office, not central office staff. So anyone who's directly involved in educating students. Uh, expenses related to employee and retiree benefits make up about 2.5 million. People services, which is primarily transportation, but also includes um, the medical office, so the nurse's office, uh, athletics, and food service, that's about 1.6 million of the budget. Physical plant and operations, so building and grounds is about 1.3 million. And I also want to note that about 55% of the budget goes to wages, uh, majority of that going directly to staff and with students. So a couple of charts here, these were all in the larger um, packet that I sent out just to give you a visualization. So that's where you see uh, almost half of the ex overall expenses are going to instruction. Salaries and wages, you can see where that larger number comes into play. And then overall, it starts to iron itself out a little bit with benefits and fixed charges being the most All right, so we're going to move on to how the budget is funded. I'm going to talk a little bit about Chapter 70. Anyone who's been around the block a few times knows that Chapter 70 is a very complicated formula, so I'm really going to get minimalistic with this. Um, if you have questions, please stop me. Um, but this is directly from Desi's website. The Chapter 70 program is a major program of state aid to public elementary and secondary schools. In addition to providing state aid to support school operations, it also establishes minimum spending requirements for each school district and minimum requirements for each municipalities share a school cost. So that last statement there, each municipality share a school cost, is what is also known as the required town contribution and has a significant impact on the assessment, which we're going to continue to talk about as we go through. And then the state aid is what Frontier actually receives from the state for um, revenue to help support the budget. Continuing talking about Chapter 70. So our state aid, Frontier State Aid in FY25, it numbers up there almost two point, or, I'm sorry, almost three million stated there. Uh, you can see in that third bullet down, it is only a $14,340 increase at over FY24. And that is because Frontier is in what is called full harmless state. And with full harmless it means that your enrollment is either declining or stagnant from the prior year. So because our enrollment has sort of leveled off or decreased, we are only seeing a minimum uh, per pupil increase of $30 per student. That translates to the $14,340. As it stands right now, this is based on the governor's budget. The last two school years, that number has increased uh, through the how the state budget process was sixty dollars per people. If that's the case, we'll receive an additional roughly fifteen thousand. At this number, it funds about twenty three percent of the district's general fund expenditures. Uh, so it leaves a pretty significant gap for us to find other funding sources, uh, which primarily comes from our towns. You're going to see one repeat theme as we continue to go through the process. I just also want to add in as you're listening to the news and stuff about the Student Opportunity Act. Student Operating to the Act is Chapter 70. So they, they just kind of recall that something else could bring more money into it. 
the majority of those funds are going to um, are going to more um, urban districts, and where the most students are. But really, there's a large number of schools like ours, over I think it's 160, that are getting minimal amount of money out of the 300 and so towns in the, in the state. So just kind of putting it out there, when the state goes, everybody else, they're doing a lot of talk at the state level about whether they're going to be correct that, but this is where we are right now. And I think it's a hand up question from someone. Yeah, you're saying this year is 23% of the general fund expenditures. Do you know what it, it's been uh, in the last couple of years? Is that a decrease from previous years? Will do. Oh. Because you're, you guys are broadcasting our sound on your system. Sorry, we will do. Well, this is going to be hard to see because it's small. We'll just read it over. 
so this is a five-year report. See, where is that? It's okay, I think it's an important question. I think people are curious about Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. 167 this year. Uh, so this might be hard to see here, um, but this gives you a, I think it is about seven years, one, two, three, seven years. Uh, you can see that the orange is total enrollment. We've gone since 2019 fiscal year, 647 students, of which 172 were school choice to 615 is what we're projecting next year with 167 being school choice. So our resident enrollment is actually dropping. Our school choice enrollment is staying relatively steady, probably on average about 175 students a year over the last seven years. So we need to begin. Begin. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Um, back on the, the last slide, Shelly. Yeah, thank you. Um, just, just for people who may be watching, uh, Sunderland's enrollment went down and our state, uh, the town required contribution went up. Is that because the assessed properties in town went up or I, I know you didn't want to get into too much detail about the formula, but every, no, well, that's a really great question, Jeff. You're, you're right on target there. So I said that there are a couple components of the formula, um, which I am going to touch on exactly what you just said. So enrollment is one of them, as is town property values and actual resident income. So the people that live in your towns, how much money they make impacts what the state says that you can afford to pay for education based on the formula. Does that answer your question, Jeff? So while your enrollment is down, your property values are, are likely higher, especially <coughs> given the market right now. Um, and as you know, we can assume that your residents are making more money. <laughs> and, and we talked about this that because of the size of our towns, you could have a millionaire or two moving to town and throw off this whole thing, and you actually didn't make more money other than hopefully they bought a very nice house. But outside of that, they can throw off the whole the whole thing and that happened i remember happening in conway a few years back where you had to move in and you had some money coming in from the, the, the dam or something of that sort and you know you were up 112 or 100,000 dollars so yeah i think some of them were able to purchase right? yeah i don't know that's yeah. exactly what some of them had yeah. they so those kind of things so yeah so that's the we don't have any control or, or understand how that number is it's just sent to us on the charity sheet Thank you. Yep, I think we had another. Yeah, and just I, I know this isn't isn't anything to do with you guys, but it's a chance to kvetch. There's something truly cruel about capping towns at raising taxes at two and a half percent, but having the formula be based on what they could pay when we can't actually <laughs> assess those taxes. So, little public soapbox there. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks. Guess I'll have to move out of town with my big salary, huh? <laughs>
especially rural districts, how all this money gets funded. I would encourage anybody who's watching or listening or getting this information one way or the other to reach out to your local representatives and share, share those concerns because we are not unique in terms of rural districts or who face these financial challenges and it ends up not just falling on the school committee's shoulders but all of yours as well. Okay, anyone else before we go? All right, let's move on. Uh, so let's talk about other funding sources next. I'm gonna quickly move through these, but again, we'll give opportunity for questions. So these are the additional funding sources. So if the chapter 70 only covers 23%, we need to make up that difference elsewhere. And this is what we're projecting for uh, next school year. So state transportation reimbursement only applies to a regional school district it is reimbursement from the state for resident students who we transport who reside at least one and a half miles from the school. So there is, again, a formula that's taken into consideration. Um, I know that the governor is committed to or has been committed to increasing the number, although we are seeing a decline here over FY24 because of the state's budget status. Um, I believe we're down about 40,000 as written on the cherry sheet stands right now. Um, Years and years and years ago, when the state put regional transportation in, into play, it was to um, incentivize small districts like ours to regionalize and provide support for that transportation. They uh, guaranteed funding at 100%, and it's never been funded at 100%. I believe last year it was 90. Uh, and the way the governor's budget rate right now is about 80%. And again, that's only reimbursement on um, residents who transport over uh, 1.5 miles from the school. Excess and efficiency is another revenue source for the district. So like our towns, uh, Frontier operates in much, much of the same fashion when it comes to E&D. We are allowed to carry excess, ex excess free cash up to 5% of the budget um, into the new year for whatever expenditures we, we see fit as school committee approved. So that could be capital projects, um, use of funds towards the budget uh, and holding for emergencies. We do have to go through an approval process with our towns when we want to use those funds, so we make sure we're following what's required by law there. Uh, and historically, over the last at least five years, if not longer, the school committee has committed $200,000 of excess and efficiency towards the next year's budget. That will be maintained in FY25. Uh, and here's where the big number comes into play again. Uh, the balance of our budget outside of what's funded by special revenues, because these three pieces on the left pertain only to the general fund, not any of our revolving funds and grants which supplements our budget. So the additional almost four million will be funded through the member town assessment. So the state says that our towns can afford to pay, um, it was 5.6 million, I think, on the last slide. Yes, 5614005. And in order for us to actually fully operate our budget or our school and meet the district requirements of almost 13 million, we will assess the town an additional $4 million roughly. Um, and that's based on a cost sharing agreement as written in the regional agreement developed, you might not remember what year, but a long time ago. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the assessment coming up. So if you do have questions about the assessment, you can hold those until we continue going through. That would be great. Uh, so then the last piece of this slide on the um, far right there explains our special special revenues. Uh, I talked about that a little bit earlier. That's where we come up with the 14.7 million versus the general fund budget of I think it's like 4.5. Um, we use an additional 1.7 million of revolving funds and grants. That could include school choice revenues. Uh, we have a thriving special education program here where we bring in students from other districts and receive tuition funds for that. that that's included here. Um, school lunch revenues. Uh, what else is in there? Athletics revolving if it supplements. Um, grants may include state and or federal grants. Some are special education related, some not. So um, it's a pretty significant number. It's about usually on average year to year an additional 10 to 13 percent of supplemental funds that is not funded through the general fund. So um, we are doing what we can to keep the general fund number down as much as we can. Any questions or revenues outside of the assessment?
I think the next slide is just a pie chart showing you here what the funding really looks like. So the chapter 78 is in the blue that is in the upper um, portion of the pie chart. The member town state required contribution is the larger green chunk. And then the additional member town assessment is the orange. So you can see our four towns are funding roughly three quarters of our budget. And then the other smaller funding sources, excess and efficiency, state transportation, and then grants and revolving funds. Quick historical information, I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but generally uh, in a five year span, Frontier's budget has grown 13.29% or $1.5 million, which translates to an average of 2.65 a year or just over $300,000 a year. Questions on yeah, thanks. More of a statement that um, in that same time frame, Sunderland's assessment has gone up 554,000 and increased about 30%. So while we appreciate everything you do to keep the overall number down, um, I do want to point out that Sunderland has seen uh, dramatically higher increases than the other towns. Which historically goes back to the state's formula, not because of the budget um, cost share percentage, but you guys did have a big swing over multiple fiscal years of what the state said that you could afford, which increased your assessment pretty significantly. All right. I believe we're getting into assessment. All right, let's talk about it, because here's what everybody wants to know, what the numbers look like. So according to the regional agreement, the cost of construction and operation are shared between member towns according to a five-year enrollment average. So the formula is the state required contribution plus the additional to fund the budget plus any capital assessment and any debt service assessment equals the total assessment to our towns annually. Cost sharing formula for next year is here. Uh, you can see the five-year rolling enrollment is based on 2,296 students. The breakdown there is, is by town. Uh, Conway share for FY25 is 16.46%. Deerfield, 48.69. Sunderland, 23.43. And Wheatley, 11.41. snapshot of the general fund assessment so you can see the total state required contribution of 5.6 million the additional assessment of 3.9 so our total general fund assessment is uh, just above 9.5 million comparatively to last year which was 9.2 so the overall assessment is 3.69 percent for the general fund Capital and debt, uh, school committee is proposing a $100,000 assessment for fire panel replacement project and a debt service assessment for the van interest that comes through in July for projects that have already been completed and voted on years ago. Uh, that debt coming through in July is just over $40,000. So the total capital and debt assessment is $140,000. 240, which is $17,045 over the prior year. <coughs> and then I've given you the total assessment numbers here. So when you add up those three components, you can see in the far column, FY24 to FY25 change. Conway is seeing a 5.25% increase, Deerfield 1.89, Sunderland 4.20, Waitley 9.51, and overall Frontier's budget assessment is growing by 3.83% for all components factor. And that is all I have to say. <laughs> but I'm happy to answer questions. We can go back to things if you have assessment questions. It's about to close up. I have some copies here if anyone wants to get copies, and I can send out the truncated slideshow as well. Who 
Everything should be done at this point. The last scary and surprising factor came last week with the transportation bill um, and that's been accounted for in here. I don't anticipate, short of an emergency, I don't anticipate any significant changes in our numbers. Yes. 
So you won't have to do another ballot. That was the part that Darius and I weren't 100% sure about. Yes, Darius? Yeah. Yeah. So there's no risk to frontier of it not getting approved at the town and not being able to assess that. So that would be only discussed later. Yeah. But, yeah. So but we're going to start. Because there's so many we have questions for. So we're just the, the, the public hearing part of this. We're having dialogue with the public, who, which is essentially our our finance and reasons like words. But um, so school so members have questions regarding that. We'll, we'll have a discussion afterwards. If we're going to alter the budget in that way, but it's a good time for a dialogue. People have questions about. Um, so we use the brain power in the room if you do. So is that your concern is that if we did that, that we'd be at risk of waiting for a ballot to approve that? Right. that yeah, okay. okay. Well, there would still be the assessment. It's just a matter of how the town pays for it. Correct. Yeah. But I would ask it. So the school committee does that later in the meeting. Um, we have a running budget tonight, so I can follow up with council and notes. Balance of 
you want to get into the details of the budget, and some people will say you're getting a little too squishy with some of the other stuff and trying to brag about what we're doing. We have a very successful school, and just by the number of, I mean, the balance of the of schools, with school choice itself, where people are valuing so much to trying to come in, where it's a point where we have to shut off missions. Um, this shows you the kind of program we're putting into our, into our book. Um, it, it is also, I, I want to mention about tech, because towns need to realize this, because I think nobody, I, I don't know who the, uh, the members of the regional tech um, and, uh, they, they are, but they've increased their enrollment by 100 students in the last five years while the county's gotten smaller. Every school in the county's gotten smaller, but tech has decided to do So that bill is going to continue to grow in each of your small towns. Because they're going to continue, they can accept more and more students, while we only can accept who are coming here because they're from our residents outside school trucks. So I'm just saying that, that that bill is increased because of the number, they've increased the number of students they accept. Um, and that's the value change of the county that where we want more test students going to tech field into what they're offering and good things. And that question of people really looking at that. You know, um, I'm not looking at different type of programming here um, that we're providing there, but. I just want to say that out loud because that is, it is what's happening. Like that bill is going to continue to um, Because we're, as a county, saying we're valuing more students going to tech group rather than um, general college preparatory and um, um, group there. So, thanks for saying that out loud. Where's this value of tech? So, general schools has the same kind of thing that right now. Um, Talk about you know, we are paying off the debt. Um, the one point, um, be one point three million dollars in the um, debt for the track and whatnot through school choice. And part of that is because the amount of money that we're spending on the bills, of students leaving this, has gone down by thirty five percent. The number of students leaving this district to go to charter schools and choice out. Sometimes you have choice out just by a family member works in a district or across the street from. You know, I call it the you know, different schools because I'm right on the border. Um, so maybe you have that, but the overall um, the idea of choosing out over discontent, so to speak, is way down, as I say, it's down 35% as it was um, just a few years before COVID. So, you know, we're, we're, less students are going out and choosing those things. Um, <coughs> they try to, we go down the charter route about how that's funding, that funding formula, and um, equal access to, you know, all students. And, but we're lucky right now, we don't have any charter schools. We do have people in charter school, it's just down 35%, which increases our overall savings to us. We are one of the few districts um, in Mass, well, certainly in the area, that is our revenue is higher coming in than this going out. Most of our neighboring towns are paying more out to charter and choice. We actually um, are able to. Um, have savings there, and then we've recently been paying on capital projects for that, and not sitting on the capital. So, um, and obviously paying off that debt that we got. It's a very good thing because, in my opinion, it's a very good thing because without the debt, we're going to be able to control year to year um, what kind of capital improvements we have. We've taken this building that is, you know, it's reached its midlife, reached its midlife crisis. Um, we replaced the boilers. We're now in the process of putting parts to the roof. Uh, we're going to the carpet and furniture has been replaced for the next 20 years. Um, you know, HVAC systems are being updated. You know, so a couple more. The big pieces are being fixed. Um, obviously, our, you, know, you saw our parking lot as you came in. It, it, it's due, but we kind of put that off because, that, as I look at it, I look at what we do inside the building is the most important. Student programming is the most important. You know. Couple of potholes um, we can work around. Um, you know. So those are the kind of the big things that are going on. So this building is going to be reset for the next 20 years. Um, you know, we don't have to be saving money for the boiler breaking down because we have three brand new boilers. We don't need to be saving money for you know, you know that kind of thing. We suddenly worry about partially the roof now. So we're not completely there yet, but at this point moving forward, with no current debt, you know, we can open up more if we decide to take on any other projects or other concerns. Uh, school choice, um, what, what's the capacity of the school? Now, I know it's only that the state says a limit. No, we can pull as many as you want. So we basically, 
the, the number we create is based on our middle school. So we get most of our students are coming to school choice from our elementary schools. We will get maybe another year or so in seventh grade. Um, we cap the seventh grade um, so that our class size is, George, help me out, is that 18 to 20? Yeah. Around 18 to 20 per class, so we cap that out. And what happens is, so we carry those two numbers through, and then the number will drop off as we lose the ninth grade, we'll lose the tech, and then some people will make different um, high school decisions at that point. That's where you know, private schools usually will go to um, you know, private uh, high school. That kind of thing. So that number, so right now our number is, for middle school, between around 115, we leave a few spots open for, you get to up to 120. That is really a cap. Um, but we leave a little bit for residents, we don't go over and the class size is too large. So for the driver in the system, is not only elementary, but also in the frontier, feeding the frontier. So they see a value. So they see a value in having their children. And then our elementary school is in public um, and that value um, is um, to a greater extent than what it is being promoted. And Frank uh, has done that pretty well. Um, so I think the opportunity. Yeah. I will mention that if you don't have questions and you're satisfied with the presentation, we can close the meeting. Just to bring it out there. You don't have to? I don't do that. I mean, I just, I don't know how long the public is going to talk for, so um, yeah. whenever you are, and I can leave this up for questions if you too, I'm just... He brings up a good point, so um, right now our element... I would certainly be fine with calling it later. I make a motion we adjourn. Second. I have a motion made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, 3 nothing. 7.02 p.m. Thank you.